Realty title. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, Sorry. no, no. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Participants. Derek Steinbach, we are going to make the host. All right. Here we go. We're live. Derek, you're now the host with the most. Uh, what was I before? <laughs> How's that? I think I think we're good. I think so. And Paige is gonna um, take off the her camera and and sound, um, but you guys carry on, and then we'll have access to the video for later. All right. Thanks cool. for being so flexible. Thanks. <clears throat> so. We'll wait for a couple other people to jump on here. Since it just went live, we'll see if anybody else joins in. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, I put on some music there. Katie, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Beth, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. Thanks for going incognito, guys. That's uh I'm eating lunch. I'm I'm eating my lunch. You don't want to see that. I know, I'm eating too, so just kinda me three. There's Kevin. All right. Well, I just got done eating my lunch, so you guys can tell me if I have uh, cilantro in my teeth or something. All right, so let's, uh, let's get rolling. Thanks for joining in the Wealth Group meeting this month. Uh, our topic today is uh, using the Burr method for real estate investing, and that is buying a property, renovating it, renting it out, refining that property, and then repeating the process over and over and over again. And the reason why this is so important is it allows people to invest in real estate and not continue to have to come out of pocket for the 20% down payment that inevitably you're going to need when you start acquiring more and more properties because you can only buy or at least the conventional thinking is that you can only buy so many properties uh, with five or ten percent down before you get to a point where um, where you're going to need to start putting 20 and 25 percent down so uh, before we get on to that today, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to, to um, give you guys a, a, sh a little idea of something I did, and this is unrelated to the Burr method. And um, about a month ago, Tara and I had been talking about different ideas that we could use to decrease our monthly cost of living. And um, we were coming up with, with basically ideas to like co-live uh, co really, or maybe house hack or something like that in a way that we're getting other people to pay our, uh, the cost of actually living in our house. And um, what we did is I, I ended up putting together a list of, um, at that time it was seven things a list of seven things that we could do that would either increase our cash flow or decrease our monthly expense of living. And a number of those things ended up being refinancing properties. Um, and uh, we ended up making a, a pretty big impact. And by pretty big, uh, the amount of money that we came up with was $3,600 a month in either decreased expense or increased cash flow. And 
uh, that, I mean, no doubt that had, that could have a really significant impact on our financial future. And um, yeah, it's thirty six hundred and four dollars a month. At least that's currently what, or what the number currently is, and which is forty three thousand dollars of either decreased expense or increased income over the course of the next year. Or it, uh, I had it by monthly financial impact, and then brought that forward, uh, extrapolated for the year. Um, a couple examples were refining a couple of properties that we had on commercial loans. And um, I actually didn't even have to do a full refi. It was no cost refi on both. And it uh, simply was a change in terms from our commercial lenders. So they took us on our existing loan and changed the interest rate from what it was to what it is now, which I think on those was like from like five and a quarter or five and a half down to four and a quarter or four um, in each case. Either way, one saved us one hundred and forty-seven dollars, and the other saved us one hundred and fifty-seven dollars. So that right there is three hundred dollars a month of additional cash flow, just because I answered or asked that question. Um, a couple of the other things we refied three conventional properties. That's a little more straightforward. That's a uh, conventional refi, and we save, or, or I'm sorry, we create an additional eight hundred and forty-six dollars by doing those three properties. They're all uh, locked and in process for closing here at the end of the month. Um, we finalized a contract for deed buyout that we were waiting on, um, paying down a line of credit um, that we've had open on and, and using that, cap, uh, that money as uh, capital for investing in other properties. We've just been carrying it. It's, a, it's an expense of about $1,700 a month um, by carrying those, uh, those open lines of credit. We're selling one of our rental properties that we talked about in um, in the one of the wealth group meetings. Kevin asked, came to me and asked me about it after we after the meeting, and it like made me think about it. And so we're we're selling that property to the existing renters uh, after doing a renovation on the basement, or we're finishing the basement for them and selling it and creating a a, a bunch of capital that. Um, we're going to use a, a good amount of that to pay down uh, those lines of credit. And then we're 1031-ing um, the other part of the money to, uh, to use to buy two other properties. So um, all in all, uh, it ends up being a, a pretty, pretty darn big thing. And we put all of it together by putting it into a spreadsheet and... Um, putting it into a spreadsheet and, and I set 24 hour goals on each one of those items. And then that just like set everything in motion. I was shocked by it. Like I did that on like a Monday or Tuesday. And by the end of the week, we literally had everything mapped out. Um, and like all sorts of the, like the big dominoes in place. Like uh, one of the other things is setting a, um, or adding a third level unit to a, an existing property we have. And, um, I set an appointment with a with an architect who's going to come and draw the plans up, and that's what we need to do for the next step. That's a, like on a 12 month timeline that'll be completed next year at this time, and to get uh, approvals for the city or from the city and everything on it, it just starts now. So um, that's a pretty big deal, and I wanted to share that to start. Um, okay, so. The Burr investing method. Are you guys familiar with this at all? Anyone by show of hands? Yes. Jacob's nodding his head. Heather, yeah, a little bit. Yes, good. So <clears throat> the, um, the idea is that you're going to, again, buy a property and find a way to improve it and pull your cash back out so that you can turn around and buy another property in the near future. Um, it only took us like one or two properties into buying properties to, uh, understand that we were going to need to figure out a way to, to create more money to buy properties because I wasn't going to be able to just earn, you know, the 20% down, at least not fast enough, uh, as fast as I wanted to acquire the properties. So, um, a really critical part of that, this process is being able to buy at a significant discount. 
And what that means is you need to be able to create enough value that maybe you're creating 20 to 25% equity in the property so that you're only having to put somewhere between zero and maybe 5,000 or 5% 5 down on any property that you do. I'm going to share my, uh, my example and share. All right, so do you guys see my, uh, my spreadsheet right now? Yeah. Yes, okay. So with the, the spreadsheet, my example here, is I buy a property for $200,000 and I'm putting $75,000 of, of rehab into the property. And when I'm done with that rehab, it's now worth $350,000, okay? That, that is the heart of the model because being able to buy it at that type of value is what is, is where all the power in this model is created. So next Here. is, yep. Can I just ask one question? When you have that rehab cost, um, is that cash out of your own? Uh, good question. So um, no, when we do it, it's not. Uh, some people do that or some people use a line of credit as, uh, as their rehab. Um, and if you, if you bought it with this $200,000 as, um, as a conventional loan, then you probably would have to use cash to make the rehab. When we do it, we use a commercial lender and they lend us. So in this example, they are um, giving us, a, or they're saying they will loan up to 80% of the cost, which is purchase price and rehab costs. So they give us 275, I'm sorry, they give us 70, no, sorry. They give us 80% of that 275,000, which down on the bottom, my portion is 55,000. That's my cash to carry in the interim. And that's what I have to put down to actually buy that property. Okay, when I buy that- the rehab. What's that? Is that the 55 and do the rehab? No, so it's, it's uh, I put down $55,000 and then I, uh, I have contractors do the work for us to do the rehab and then the bank then allows us to do construction draws on against the $75,000 that we borrowed and then they pay the contractors directly. Got it. Through the title company, okay? Um, good question. So, in in this in this scenario, they're um, they're lending us, you know, two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and we have to put up the fifty five thousand dollars to to acquire the property. So, <clears throat> back to the um, to the model here is that the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's a number that you have to get to know and you have to know well when you walk into a property what it could be worth in the event that um, or after you do any of the work or even if you don't do any work and you just look at you walk into a house and you say okay well I can buy this house for two hundred thousand dollars and I mean if I put it on the market it's going to be worth 230 and I'll go on enough of those appointments where there's instant equity present and the people for whatever reason just want to sell it for less or maybe they want a quick sale or maybe they don't want to put it on the market or or whatever um knowing what this top dollar amount is is important though because that's the number that your future loan amount will be based on and the way i find that is best example or easiest example maybe is in a townhome neighborhood you know in a townhome neighborhood almost all of them are or in a lot of cases they're all the same right either end units or middle units so if i go into an end unit and then just go back and look at all the end units that have sold in the last year i can see where the end units sell 
okay? And if I'm able to buy an end unit underneath that price, then okay, that's easy. That it's easy to know that that the potential value is that number, right? Next step would be doing the same thing and doing it in like Minneapolis, where there's a lot of houses of the same age, and you can get a very um, very exact in location. Maybe you take like a four block radius and you say, you draw a circle around that four blocks and then say, okay, well, let's, let's get really exact on it and figure out what, you know, what else is out there um, or what has sold in that four block radius that is like this house in structure or uh, structure or maybe total finished square feet, depending on what type of house it is. And when you look at it, you can, um, you can understand that uh, a top level house in that area could sell for, in this case, 350,000, okay? So that's really the, the, the starting place for this is being able to, to walk into any property and just have an idea of what you think it's worth or what you think it could be worth if it were all fixed up. Now, the next, part of it is understanding what the rehab cost could be. And I would say that, um, it, at least in my experience, um, you have to, you almost have to do some projects or be acquainted with some projects or at least collect bids on projects before you can have any realistic idea of what the rehab is going to cost. Scott, would you agree with that? Me, Scott? Yeah. Yes, I would agree with that. Because yeah. the costs are getting way out of whack and you just want to be aware of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when when we do it, so we've been doing it now, um, gosh, it's going, it's for what, probably eight or nine years now that we've been doing this. And um, the the rehab number is the number that we screw up most of the time. And um, I would say that it's, um, it's something that we've just become ac uh, accustomed to or, or more comfortable with. And um, knowing that when we go into buying one of these properties, our cost to buy it, it, it costs us $55,000 to buy it. And I know that my cost to hang on to the property is probably going to be somewhere between I mean, in this example, maybe zero and $20,000 or something like that, just depending on what the cost of the rehab ends up being. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, so the, the next step down on the ladder here is, is the amount that a bank would finance. And that's 75% of the after repaired value is what a commercial lender is generally going to be uh, be willing to do on a cash out refi, and that's a commercial lender, 75% loan to value on a cash out refi. And the beautiful thing about this is that uh, our lenders will lend that 75% based on the, the, the appraisal that we have when we buy the property. So, when we buy the property, they do what's called a future value appraisal. And they look at our list of improvements and they also look at our past work, but they look at that list of improvements and say, okay, with these improvements, that house will be worth uh, the after repaired value. Um, and when they do that, then uh, in most cases, or in a lot of cases, it's the same bank that's willing to do that end loan with us, and they, they are willing to cash us back out after it's done. In the past, we've needed to have, uh, we've had some lenders where we needed to have another lender that would then buy us back out and hold the end loan on the back end. Um, and in most of those cases, those lenders did require us to have a new appraisal. Um, it's always, it's always just touchy when you have to get another appraisal because the market can change over six months or the, you know, whatever the time period is. And when that happens, you can go from, if you're after repaired value, look at this. So in this example, 
we've got uh, in a commercial loan, we have $12,500 into it. Uh, on a conventional loan where we do 80% loan to value, we're, we're actually able to get $5,000 back, okay? Now, if, this, if, if we had to get an appraisal done and um, our after repaired value changed from 350 to 330, you can see how these numbers pretty significantly change. I mean, now cash left in the deal has more than doubled up to $27,500, or in the conventional sense, now you're actually uh, needing to leave in $11,000. So um, I have not had, uh, eh, I actually we have had, but um, it's pretty, it would be pretty uncommon for uh, a lender to have the appraisal done and have it come back even higher um, because I'm generally asking for, uh, I'm asking for them to appraise it for what I'm looking for. So their appraiser is going in and with, with my value in mind and they're looking to justify my value rather than, you know, hey, Mr. Appraiser, go out to this house and you just tell us what you think it's worth. Like that could be a $75,000 swing depending on the appraiser's mood, you know, or, or even which comps he chooses to, to use. So um, does everybody grasp that concept? Yes. Does anybody not understand some part of that? Or is there any question on this part of, of this? No? Okay. Um, great. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. So that that uh, model is extremely important because that's the like the the lever in this in this scenario that allows you to get to a point where um, I say all the time. I just turned $15,000 into $75,000. And that is how I do it. Because when you leave $15,000 in a property and you have $75,000 of equity in the property, you're turning that $15,000 into the $75,000. And it's like instant, as soon as it's done, it's there. So <clears throat> that's super important because when you take that and put it on your personal financial statement, that's immediately where you build wealth, okay? Um, uh, so one of the things that makes, um, makes properties harder to figure out that after repaired value is um, like more variables. And um, maybe a, a, an easy example for us to talk about would be um, like Lakeshore property. Um, Lakeshore property, depending on the quality of the lakeshore, the amount of footage, or the livability of the house, like those, each of those things really impacts a lake home. And I think in that example, you'd have to be really careful about what you're getting into to, uh, to understand um, what it is that, that, like the true opportunity there. And especially in a, in a situation like that, um, one missed variable or one misunderstood piece of that could affect your value very significantly. And as we looked at, even, even a $20,000 change in appraised value had a significant amount. I mean, it doubled our amount of cash that we needed to leave, leave in that property. And I mean, that's a like you're starting to play with fire. The more and more you get into that, uh, that's where you'd really want to be careful. Um, We, uh, so in the, the, the 75% threshold has been very important for us. And that 75%, um, because that's the amount that the commercial lenders will lend. And I think that's important because if my numbers work under that uh, scenario, then 
I know that I have that, like that is my fallback plan or that is my, my ultimate, um, like get out of jail. Like I'm, I know I'm not going to have to leave more money in a property than that. Um, because I've had enough scenario or enough situations where I've been trying to do a conventional refi on properties and it just doesn't work or it just, um, because of any of the prop, uh, problems that come up with conventional loans, like oftentimes you need to have a six month seasoning period uh, in a property where the, the cash actually needs to sit in a property for six months. Um, and, you know, six months on, um, or especially like when we were using our own cash initially to acquire properties, to have, uh, you know, $60,000 sitting in a property tied up for six months like that that really gets to be cumbersome and especially like we've got the sixty thousand dollars we needed to buy it and then we went fifteen thousand dollars over over budget on the, on the project too and that we have to come out of pocket for so now we've got seventy five thousand dollars into it and it it just um becomes more and more stressful as that goes on whereas with the commercial loan like we talk about like as soon as the project's done like the day that the project is done. I've got the, uh, the bank person back into the property again, and they're working on my end loan and maybe three weeks to a month later, I've got my, I've got my money back. So, um, for the, the renovation part of the Burr method, what's important, what is it going to cost to get the property to rentable condition? Um, and rentable condition, I think, is, is important because in this scenario, that's, that's the threshold that I need to get it to. And I say more importantly, to get it to appraise properly, because in this method, I have to get the value up of the property up to the point that it's going to appraise proper, properly. Um, so that I get my money back because I don't want to leave a ton of money or a bunch of money just sitting in a property and, um, you know, waiting to get it back at some point later point in time. So we've, it comes, and I guess I say it like that because we've left uh, or had money tied up in project projects where we just can't get them finished or, or, um, you know, we've, been cutting corners and I paint the house and then it ends up looking like crap. And then, you know, I, I, like this is a real thing, right? Um, I would say that we generally over improve our properties. And the reason we over improve them is specifically to get that value up because uh, especially on a long-term loan, I'm not concerned about uh, I'm definitely not concerned about like the short term aspect of it. I'm looking at getting that value up high and then putting it into service, renting it out, and then letting like the letting the forces of the market and the forces of of real estate math work for me. Okay. Um, the tenants like when it's all redone too, right? Tenants like to rent a nice place. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, mm -hmm. we, like we've seen over and over where. Um, uh, I would say that our, our properties rent really fast because they're in great condition. And then um, with very, very little to no vacancy. And um, and do you think you even get a little more money, a little more rent from it yeah. too with having it so nice? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think we get more. Um, I'm not generally super, super aggressive on my rent prices, meaning I don't like charge a really high amount for my rents. Um, and I do that because I, I would like for people to stay and the, it's, it's a double-edged sword because now I've, I have some properties where people have been in them a long time. And my rents are now out of, out, like out of market. They're under market because of that. Um, and it's so much easier to have a property that the tenants never leave, especially when it's still making money. Um, it, like, it's just easy turning a property over every year becomes very cumbersome and it just becomes a lot of work um, every year. I mean, work in cleanup, in communication, in uh, real estate, like as far as listing it and talking to new tenants and finding their new people and collecting deposits and everything, it's just easy when everybody's just paying, paying their rent and continuing to live there. So, 
Um, one another thing that we that I uh, thought about with over uh, along the lines of over improving the property is um, working now versus working later, or work now versus work later. And um, there are a good number of people who will not choose to make certain repairs um, when they purchase a property and they'll push it down the road and, and do things as repair. Um, and like I would say, like the mechanicals, furnace, air conditioner, um, maybe replacing windows or um, you know some of these things like that. And um, we've, we've, I would say we've come full circle or maybe learned our lesson enough or maybe just had enough experience with um, with having uh, like it's definitely not worth it to me to have furnaces go out in the middle of the night or um, water heaters you know like a water heater is like eight hundred dollars or something like that in the in the beginning of a project and as long as we have a plumber in there anyway we might as well just replace it and then it's gonna be good for you know five to seven years or, or whatever the life expectancy is same thing I, I think with a furnace too is once we've got them in there and they're new, they're gonna be good for, for quite a while, as long as we have some uh, regular maintenance on them. And it's so much easier just to, to get things on a maintenance schedule than it is to um, try to keep keep up with like uh, these units that just continue to go out and out and out and the tenants don't like that either. So, um, so working now or making work now versus doing work later. Uh, and not to mention when you do it and refi back out, you're now amortizing whatever you did over 27 and a half years. So who really cares if you spent an extra $5,000 on a furnace and AC or something. So um, so that's making the capital improvements up front. I do think that you, uh, you will save money in the long run by doing it that way versus like coming back and needing to do these things over time. Um, renting the property. Um, we've talked about renting properties enough. I think the, for the Burr method or to like understand with a Burr model is to understand what a property will rent for when it's complete. And, um, I think that number might be even harder to come up with than, the um, than the, the, uh, after repaired value, because unless you know the area and know, um, other properties that have rented in the area, it's, I think it's really hard to know what somebody's going to be willing to pay. Um, I use uh, MLS as a resource and um, we'll look up properties, rented properties in the area and see if, um, you know, find them and, you know, see how they compare to ours or what ours is going to be. And, and a lot of times I'm going off of like feel of, what I think and um, for our properties I know school district makes a big difference on on ours and um, of school district and availability of other properties so um, anybody have any question on that great uh, for the refi portion of of the Burr method who is going to hold the end loan is a is a, a question that you, at least I I ask myself like at the beginning of the project when I first buy a property like who's who am I gonna or who's gonna hold this this end loan and um, how am I gonna do it and certainly if you can get a, a conventional lender to to hold it then I think that's great um, and. Um, it's a, it's been a, like an ongoing um, search for us as we've grown our company to continue to find lenders that will hold these loans on the back end. And, um, you know, holding, we've even gone through and like, so when we purchase a property and then we refi back out, uh, the purchase with purchase and construction loan was one lender. And then we refi back out and it goes to another lender. And then it's with that lender for a couple of years. And then we'll take it and get another lender to take it again, again. And when we get that lender to take it again, the reason we're doing it is so that we're taking the debt off of the second lender's books because we need them 
to take it off of the first lender's books or we, we need them to take it take other new projects off of the first lender's books because we've run into that um, different lender or each of the lenders they may only want to be exposed to so much of our real estate like we don't have one that wants to hold on to like you know three four million dollars of our business like they, they kind of want to spread things out a little bit so we'll use them as a tool to like season the loan once we once we establish ourselves then we can turn it around so we did that with um, the 21st century bank here locally where they are now holding one loan for us that has four properties on it and they were able to basically wipe away um, all of our debt with one lender so that we could use uh, reuse that lender to then use uh, start doing new uh, takeout loans I call them I, I call them takeout loans because they take out the first lender um, and uh, that's been that's been something that that uh, especially when we were in our first gosh two three four years of existence in business I was talking to a lot of lenders and um, an awful lot. I, I had way more that told me no than those that told me yes. And um, my my pitch to the to the lenders was, I needed to find an end loan lender. Like that was the hard part. And I needed to find somebody that would um, take unseasoned loans and cash us back out. And so I'd have the conversation with the lender who. Uh, will you do this? And when they'd say no, then I'd ask them, you know, do you know anybody who would do that loan or, or who do you know, or, or who should I talk to that, um, that might have uh, something that would meet that criteria. And sure enough, we ended up finding like um, a number of commercial lenders. There was some, a couple small credit unions, not even necessarily small, but credit unions um, and different places where like they were just willing to, to because of whatever their strategy was or wherever they were at that time, they were willing to do some loans that other people weren't willing to do. So um, for us, that was definitely the biggest challenge. Now we're in a position now where I think we could probably uh, double the size of our uh, our company or double the size of our holdings or, or whatever if, if, um, if we were able to find the properties. I think the lenders, uh, with the relationships we have established now, I think they would just uh, double it. Uh, each of them would double their stance and um, and allow us to purchase more. So, um, <clears throat> so with the lenders, they need to know what you're doing before you're doing it. Because I think the thing... Um, like nothing would undermine a relationship faster than you doing something that's other than what you told them. And, and that's where we built our relationship with the lenders we work with is by consistently just doing what we say we're going to do. And um, like an example of that is we've had, we've had plenty of properties where we purchased them originally as uh, either a flip or a rental and then ended up flip-flopping and doing the other. But the reason we, we did the other was because it wasn't working how we were, how we had originally ten, intended to do that. So what I mean is we, we had a property that we were intending to flip and resell. And then um, we get to the point where we've got it on the market for 30 days. It hasn't resold. Well, like I'm not going to sit there and lose money on it or whatever. I'll turn it around and turn it into a rental and, you know, turn around and, and then refi back out. But the important part is I'm, I'm uh, changing the direction of the property and then I'm, I'm going back to my original lender and I'm now paying him off, which is what he wanted in the first place because I was flipping the house. That means he gets paid uh, or paid back. So I'll take him out with another lender take it off their books. Now I've now fulfilled my obligation to that first lender. And for us, that was definitely like an important part of the process of just establishing the relationship and getting them to the point where they trust us to do what we say we are going to do and that we're not going to just, you know, turn around and leave them hanging out.
we've had uh, we've had a couple examples where um, where we've had uh, our original lender like where we've turned our construction loans into longer term loans um, but it was actually our lender that asked us to do that rather than um, rather than take the debt somewhere else so um, so the structure of how you do the deal is extremely important as far as uh, as are extremely important to you being able to get your money back out on these deals and um, what I mean by that is in a on a conventional loan we talked about um, the six month waiting period or six month seasoning period uh, we have a lender that is um, willing to do a, do a, our construction loan differently so that there is no uh, six month waiting period and the way they do that is they allow us to rather than putting down a down payment on the loan they actually in our previous example it was a two hundred seventy five thousand uh, dollar was our two hundred seventy five thousand dollars was our cost um, instead of, of requiring us to put down the fifty five thousand uh, dollars on the loan and then they do a two hundred twenty thousand dollar loan they give us a two hundred seventy five thousand dollar loan and have us put down $55,000 into a CD on deposit with the bank that is used as collateral against that purchase. And what it does is when, the, uh, when we go to refinance conventionally on that loan, the conventional lender doesn't, re uh, doesn't view us getting our CD back as us getting cash out of the refi. Does that make sense? A little bit? So that's, that's like a difference that the structure makes all the importance there, or that makes like the whole deal work in that we don't have to wait then. We can now maybe do a conventional refi, maybe it's 30 days after our project's complete. Um, and because they're willing to do that, that's the way, you know that's the way it works so <clears throat> knowing your knowing your structure is important and definitely always working uh, working with that end goal in mind and um, I would you know make sure you have the conversation with uh, with your bankers so that they know what you're doing and know um, like and that they should be looking out for you as far as um, they've been great actually with me, like looking out for me and making sure, like making sure that they're, they're doing something that's not going to hurt us down the road. They've been great about that actually. Um, so something else to consider with the Burr method is how much do you need to get out and is leaving some money in a deal necessarily terrible? And I, I would say, no, it's not necessarily terrible. I don't, I don't necessarily try to get all my cash back out of every property. Um, and really I would, like I said before, I would expect somewhere between zero and 20 grand, just like as a basic idea. Um, and um, where does it leave you in terms of cash flow? And I think that's where um, if you go in with your future value number in mind or that after repaired value at a certain price point, um, and figuring back through the rest of your numbers on your cash flow, if you look at it and you may need to play around with the amount of money that you leave in a property to make sure that your cash flow is proper. So um, just something to consider. And then the last part of the Burr method is repeat how to systematize your process uh, to replicate the motions, uh, do, you know, doing it over and over and over again. And, Certainly, the um, I mean the things that we've we've done that, that make that a lot easier is is having great relationships with contractors um, so that we don't have to find a new contractor for every project. Um, the bank, you know, using a bank and and finding different banks like it's almost like you're putting together like a sports team and like you know the one bank plays shortstop and one blank bank plays second base and one you know does outfield or whatever and like if you think of them that way, because each of those banks uh, 
each of those banks likes to do business in certain ways. And not all of those ways are like aligned for everything that you want to accomplish. So using them as, as players or tools is I think really important to the process. So wrapping up here, uh, challenges we've faced is definitely low appraisals. Um, that's been like an, like an ongoing saga for years, right? Uh, and that goes back to like our, our second deal. Our first deal, of course, went great. And we ended up with like $4,000 in a house and we were super stoked. Then the next one, we had like $25,000 left in it at the end of the project and that sucked. So, um, it, and it's been like that ever since, right? So, um, the low appraisals thing is like a, a real problem and I've gotten, um, I've, I guess I've gotten better about how I'm, how I'm handling the appraisers when they go and our future value appraiser is almost always the same woman and I have a great relationship with her. She knows what our work looks like and, um, and you won't have that until you've, done, you've started to do projects and, and have like projects with the same bank and have the same person coming out. What I can say is that um, explaining, making sure you're explaining the level of the, uh, of the level of the work that you're doing and using specific or citing specific comps and, and, and sharing with them specifically why you think those comps are relevant to your project and um, you know maybe why like how you're getting to the justification you're getting to and um, you know I I would say that we've also had I've had a couple of them get kind of like pissed at me or offended that I'm like doing their job and then there's most of them are willing to have like a constructive conversation about it and like um, and, and I would say that I'm not asking for um, unrealistic. So um, I might ask them to like push the edge a little bit, but it's it it'll never be like you know twenty percent off or something like that. You know, it's just not like I'm not going into it with that expectation. Um, properties not renting has been a thing at um, at a couple different points over the years where. Um, you know, maybe it's like timing of the market where you believe it or not, we've had some trouble, like in the spring when there's just a lot of inventory and maybe our property doesn't look super perfect and it's coming out of a project or whatever. Like we've, we've been slow to rent and that's a, that's a challenge we've faced. And, you know, certainly in the beginning we were in a position where we couldn't afford to, to carry a property for too long. Um, without getting pretty beat up uh, financially on it. Um, and that's a real problem. Um, I would say if you ever have a problem with getting your property rented, like come talk to me or, or something and we can figure out what, what's going wrong or why it's not happening. Um, project cost going up, that seems pretty obvious, but that's like a, we run into problems when we start tearing apart houses and rehabbing and, um, I mean, it's going to happen with everybody. I would say uh, a big important factor is just, um, you know, building in a, a project contingency so that you've got, you know, 10% or $10,000 or something like that, that, you know, that, that is your budget overage. And um, you're just planning that you're going to find something along the, the course of the project that, that does come up or does need to be fixed. And I mean, we've done a lot of projects and I, I could probably count on one hand the, the, the number of times like that we've had things come in under budget. <laughs> it's like, it just never happens that way. Um, you know, unseen issues. So solutions that we've, um, solutions that we've come up with and um, over the years is loans that don't require appraisals are super easy to work with. And, um, more so than loans, but like just lenders that don't require appraisal or, or lender that lender that uh, is willing to use our future value appraisal um, for their refinance loan. Like that makes it super simple. And um, I think we're actually where we're not where we are now is 
our construction lender is willing to take the loans that they have, our construction loans and roll them into an amortizing uh, long-term end loan. And that's actually made our life really easy with these because we, we just don't have to like, I don't have to double communicate anything. They already have the, all the information. And then um, they've already, they, they have representatives who've been out to the project and have like investigated or like seen it and inspected it and like they know it. Um, and then once we've got it rented and they know that we're, we're covering um, our expense on it, then they're, you know, they're more than willing to do it. And most of the time it takes like two or three weeks to get the refi done. And, and actually it's not even a refi. They like, um, I forget what they call it. They like, uh, re recast maybe, um, is what they do. And then if they, they like turn, it basically turns the loan into it. And we have like, uh, it's like a third of the cost of a normal refi. It's like maybe a couple grand or something like that. And it, really works slick. Um, having multiple exit strategies on properties. Um, and that's something that's like saved our bacon a number of times over the years, whether that ends up being um, renting properties that we were going to sell or selling properties that we were going to rent or taking a property that we were going to sell and then selling it on contract for deed. Um, you know, it's been, it's been like, it's actually been kind of funny because over the years, it, it seems like we've, we've done that a number of times. Um, and actually what it, what it does, it actually, I've been like fairly upset about, um, like at, when I drive by what property that we sold that I originally intended to rent. And then I drive by it now and I'm like, yeah, I sold that house for like 295,000 and now it's like 400,000. It's, it's like a little nauseating or whatever, but um, yeah, cause we sold it for like a $20,000 profit and gave up a hundred grand. Um, the, uh, the property's not renting, uh, I'm sorry, multiple exit strategies. Um, the contingency plans, like uh, not only having multiple exit strategies, but then having like having backup strategies that you're able to immediately implement when things go wrong. And uh, I mean, in a way, it's kind of like selling real estate. Like when we run into problems in, in selling real estate, um, we, we already have like little backup plans that we we put things back together. And I, I think um, the same can be said for um, for these these projects and and being able to just have another way to um, to like figure things out. Um, also, like when things do go wrong, um, having a having a strategy on like another way to solve the problem too is just really critical. Um, having multiple end loan lenders has gotten us out of, uh, out of trouble on a number of deals, like just where, you know, some, all of a sudden our intended lender isn't, isn't willing to take the loan anymore for whatever reason. And, um, you know, that's something we don't generally like put up with. I, I like when we figure out who's going to take something like they need to take it. Um, and it has happened over the years where they won't. Um, last thing I'll say that I think has been really important for us is um, criteria, and that's keeping your criteria in front of you all the time and um, sticking to that when it comes to, especially on, on properties that you're going to rent and hang on to. Like, I think it just becomes really important that you're in uh, it, in the environment that you want to be in and holding on to a property that is an area that you want to want to work in or want to have a property in. And um, I mean, maybe the, maybe like easy way of saying it is like, I'm, I'm always happy to, am I always happy? I, I'm always willing to go to one of my houses and I don't have to worry about my safety or Tara's safety or something like that. And, um, that's always been, that's always been one of our criteria. And I, the criteria came about from me saying, or from us saying, I won't take full credit from us saying that we didn't want to own any properties that we wouldn't be willing to live in. And that's kept us out of a lot of trouble. And, um, you know, a, a 
the thing is like on any of these projects, like we get into a project and do a great job and like revitalize a house. And it's been a house that's like, ever been, then uh, people in the neighborhood have been hating on it for a while. Cause it's been all beat up and stuff. And like, when they see us do that, then they'll come over and talk to us. And um, you know, inevitably we end up either getting referrals for other business off of it, or um, you know, they, they want to talk to us more about our business. And when that, when that opportunity is in the area that you want to work, um, I think it just makes it that much more uh, impactful and um, allows you to move your business forward. So, and especially in an area that, like, that you want to be in. So who's, uh, who has some questions or are there any? Yeah, Derek, I got two questions for you, Derek. Yeah. Uh, one, when you buying individual, so, your company, is it a corporation, an LLC, or do you set up individual comp individual LLCs for each property you're purchasing with? And yep. the, other, the other question is, uh, do you ever use non-recourse loans? Or are they available to any, to any degree? So, um, we, uh, like quite some time ago, we had a conversation with uh, like advisors and uh, accountant and uh, attorney and insurance person and the decision we made was to um, purchase our properties in one company it's an S Corp and it is an LLC as well um, but it's an S corporation and we purchased properties in that company and that company uh, both re rehabs and flips properties and rehabs and holds properties and um, the insulation for that company for us is uh, is in, like in the form of an insurance policy. Like we have a liability umbrella that protects that company and us from from that company. Okay. Rather than separating each of the properties out, and they uh, the both. Both our insurance company and our uh, accountant um, advised us that you know that that we would we would likely save uh, save more money long term that way than than doing it the other way. Um, and because like if, if each one of them is its own separate thing, then each of them has to be on their own separate tax return. And um, yeah. yeah, so that was that. Um, as far as non recourse loans, we. Uh, do not have any non-recourse loans that, uh, yeah, not, not that I have, or we don't have any of those at this time. So, um, you know, I, uh, the only, the only ones that I've really looked into have been like big, big, uh, non-recourse, like, uh, commercial loans and big meaning, uh, loan amounts greater than probably two or three million and I like I don't know that I'm maybe I'm missing out on something in it but okay thank you yeah Beth what question can I answer for you nothing just smile thanks <laughs> Jacob you're usually good for a question or two I think I'm good this time but at least for now. Yeah. I'll pop by later, I'm sure. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess on that note, thanks a lot for coming, guys. Thank you, Derek, for hosting. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Come thank and talk you. to me if you have any questions, all right? Take care. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.